Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I love you. It doesn't take long in life to realize that those words can be easier said than they are to do. The little boy that runs up to his mom and screams at her, I love you, mommy, and then runs down the hallway into his bedroom, picks up his crayons and begins to color on the wall that his mother had repeatedly told him not to do. The husband who hands his wife a beautifully decorated Hallmark card that includes this flowery language that describes his great love for his wife and then he proceeds to turn on his selective hearing as his wife asks him to come into the kitchen and help her with dinner. The teenage daughter who receives her weekly allowance from her parents and says to them, thanks, I love you guys, only hours later to be heard stomping down the hallway, slamming her bedroom door and screaming at her parents, I hate all of your stupid rules, as she'd been reminded of her 11 o'clock curfew that evening. I love you. Those words are easy to say, very easy to write, but often difficult to do and to demonstrate. But when you think about it, isn't that what makes Lent such a joy-filled season? Yes, during Lent, our joy is, as we're repeatedly reminded, muted during this season, and yet our joy cannot be diminished. Because during the Lenten season, we see the greatest demonstration of God's love that our world has ever seen. As those familiar words of John chapter 3 remind us this morning. Those words from John chapter 3 are familiar to us, and yet they are no less amazing on this day than the very first day that we heard them or the very first time that Jesus spoke them. And I would invite you this morning to read along with me. John chapter 3, verse 16. Let's read together. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now let me ask you this morning, who are the people that you love in your life? Usually we love the people who act lovable back to us, right? It's not difficult for the wife to love the husband who empties the dishwasher without being asked. It's not difficult for the husband to love the wife who continues to tell, her, tell him of her appreciation for his hard work. It's not hard to love the child who cleans their room before they've ever even been asked and talks politely and respectfully to adults. But how about the direct opposite? How about loving the lazy husband? How about loving the nagging wife? How about loving the disrespectful and disobedient child? How about loving the annoying co-worker? You see, that's where God shows his love. For God so loved the world. The world. I mean, just think about that. What is the world like? If you need some help some evening, turn on primetime TV and just watch an hour and get a glimpse into the mind and into the hearts and into the lives of the people of our world. Sex has turned into a recreational activity. Greed has become good, beneficial to an advancing and successful career as it now is your motivation. Selfishness is justified as just caring for yourself. Lying in unfaithfulness is all right, just so long it doesn't hurt somebody around you. God's name is thoughtlessly, repeatedly called upon. The theory of evolution is falsely taught as scientific fact. The voice of conscience is drowned out as people flaunt their sin in the face of God, as they try to validate and take pride in their sinful lifestyles, and then try to make other people feel ashamed because they're not as open-minded or tolerant as 
they are. Yes, our world is anything but a bright, burning beacon of love for God. But that lack of love is not just restricted to those in the world. The shadows of lovelessness can be found in our hearts and lives too, right? You heard Jesus refer in John chapter 3 to the incident of the bronze snake, and, and you heard it described just a moment ago in our first lesson from Numbers. Do you realize who those people were? Those were God's people. They had repeatedly seen some really amazing things. They had seen God's love on display in some powerful ways. Some of them had walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. Those people had gathered at Mount Sinai and they had seen God give His law directly to them. They had seen God give to the Israelites unlikely victory over enemies that vastly outnumbered them. They had seen water come from regular old rocks. And yet as soon as it took a little bit too long for them to get to the promised land, what did they start to do? But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There's no bread, there's no water, and we detest this miserable food. Well, we might like to think of ourselves as being a little bit more lovable than those Israelites. Are we really? Are there ever times when you've complained to God because he didn't answer your prayers in the way that you thought that he should? Or because God is taking a little bit too long in your estimation to give the healing, the recovery that you wanted, or to repair the relationship that you're trying so hard to repair? Has selfishness ever held you back from sharing what God has given to you, holding on to those things as if your very life depended upon them? Have we ever been quick to complain to God for what He has chosen not to give to us and slow to thank God for all the things that He has given to us? So lovable? Not exactly. But that is exactly why Lent is so remarkable. Lent is not some big hallmark card from God sent to our world that reads on it, so sorry to hear about your sinful situation. Hope things turn around. Love you all. That's not Lent. Lent is not words that are just wishful thinking or hollow or half-hearted speech from our God. Lent is a wholehearted demonstration of God's love for our world. You know the words, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. God's love does not make demands of us. God's love gives to us everything that we ever needed for our salvation. Just as God mercifully brought healing to the Israelites from that bronze snake that was lifted up. So God has brought eternal healing to our world by lifting up His only Son, Jesus Christ, onto the cross. What amazing love when you realize that God sent His Son, Jesus, into a hostile and rebellious world. A world that is described in the first chapter of John in this way. Jesus was in the world... And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Just think of that. God sends his son Jesus into this world to live a perfect life for a rebellious people. For every single person without exception. For all of those who have flaunted their sin. For all of those who have hated Jesus and despised him. For all of those who have tried to love him. For all of those who have failed to honor him with their lives and their decisions. For all of those who are eager to receive the blessings he gives, 
but neglect thanking him for them. God would send his son to live a perfect life for all people and would have that son lifted up on the cross of Calvary in order to take the curse of sin. God the Father would punish his son Jesus for nothing that Jesus had done wrong, but for our sins and for the sins of all people without exception. All of this God did in order to bring that eternal healing of the forgiveness of our sins to all people because God knew that without Jesus, we would surely perish forever. You see, Jesus is he's the eternal game changer. He says and promises to every single one who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus comes into this world for one purpose, which he clearly states. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus didn't come here in order to send people to hell or to condemn people. All people by nature already stand condemned and guilty because of their sin. Jesus came so that there could be a new verdict. Jesus came into this world so that all of those who trust in him, that Jesus would give his perfect life in payment for sins, so that that verdict at the end of our life would immediately be changed from guilty to not guilty, to innocent, and worthy of life eternal in heaven. Sadly, Jesus makes it clear in these verses that there are those, however, who, who choose to live in the darkness, who choose to live in the delusion of sin. And, and Jesus puts it this way. He says, But men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Now, Jesus' words, when you hear those words, might sound kind of strange to us. We might even find ourselves thinking, well, why wouldn't a person want to live in the light of salvation? Why wouldn't they want Jesus' forgiveness and, and all the blessings that come through faith in him? Why would people actually love and choose to live in the, the damning darkness of unbelief? But think about the Pharisees of Jesus' day. Why did they hate Jesus? They hated Jesus because they knew that if they accepted him to be the Son of God and their Savior, they would need to admit that their lives were not good enough to get into heaven. That they had sinned and that they needed the help that Jesus was offering. That they would have to change what they had been teaching, that they might lose some of their power, that they would have to change from now what they were admitting were their sinful ways. Their sinful pride was so powerful that it would not allow them to make such an admission. They didn't want to change what they were doing. They were, they were comfortable living in the darkness and continuing to live in that delusion, that lie of sin. And sadly, when you start to listen to people around you, sometimes you hear people in our world doing the same thing. Have you ever talked to somebody and told them that you were a Christian, eventually came out in your conversation, and they said, well, that's nice for you. But they made it very clear to you that that's just nice for you. They don't really need your religion. They don't need Christianity, and they certainly don't need Jesus. They don't want Jesus to tell them what is right and wrong. They can make their own decisions. They can live their own lives. And yet when you think about it, what is that person choosing to do? Exactly what Jesus warned of. They continue to live in the darkness and the delusion. Refusing to live in that light of salvation that is Jesus Christ. Well, certainly, traditionally, during Lent, it's a very dark and somber season, and rightfully so, as we take time to reflect upon Jesus' suffering and death. Yet there is a magnificent joy in Lent. 
a magnificent joy that radiates from the cross of Christ. For that cross of Christ is the brightest and best demonstration of God's love for our world. It is that cross of Christ that beams with the message of our forgiveness. Forgiveness to a a sin-sick and dying world as, as God offers His Son's life in order to bring us eternal life in heaven. It is that message of the cross that the Holy Spirit has used to lead us out of that darkness of unbelief to now live by God's grace in light. The light that is Jesus. The light that is our salvation. It is that light of Christ that allows us... It's not a blinding light. It's not one that forces us to turn a blind eye or a deaf ear to the world around us, but rather it is a light that opens up our eyes to see the truth. To see those that still live in the darkness and to love them just as Christ has to continue to reach out with that gospel light so that by God's grace and the work of the Holy Spirit, they too may live in that glorious light of salvation that we live in each and every day of our life. It is that light of the love of Christ that that shows us the opportunities now to reflect Christ's love and to grow in it with the people inside and outside our homes, throughout our community, and all around the world. Yes, during Lent, our joy may be somewhat muted, but our joy cannot be diminished. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That is God's love to you. Amen.